the Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford University. Reinvigorating gender equality in the 21st century. Jeremy and I did a talk called Switch Hitting, and it was about the fact that women have learned to bat on both sides. We can hit home runs in the office, and we can hit home runs at home, and we can and do bat wherever we are. But men are not switch hitters yet. By and large, they can swing at work, but they're not swinging for the home team. So we wanted to talk about what it's gonna take for men to become switch hitters, where they're equally powerful and equally important and equal contributors at home and at work, because that's gonna be good for everybody. Jeremy's gonna tell you about what it feels like inside the home. I'm gonna tell you about what's happening outside the home that is forcing changes right now. Um, the answer is really simple, it's money. Fathers are changing because the economy demands that they change. So in 2009, I'm sure you saw this, women became more than 50% of the workforce. This was big news. But as a journalist and somebody who follows these things, I kind of said, so what? We went from 49% of the workforce to 50% of the workforce? It, we've been 40% of the workforce for a long time. And we've been in the workforce for hundreds of years. It is not news that women work. What is news is that women have money, and that's what's changing, and that is what is very recent. Very recently, and I'm talking about the last 10 years, we have seen a dramatic rise of women's economic power. We are rapidly reaching a tipping point that is going to finally drive some much needed social change, and that could, we hope, empower some breakthroughs that can finally start moving that stalled revolution that we are all so worried about. But don't take it from me. The Economist magazine pointed out that for the past two decades, the increase in female employment in the rich world has been the main driving force of growth. The article went on to say that women have contributed more to global GDP than either new technology or the new giants, China or India. What? Women have contributed more to global GDP growth than technology? This is 20 years. 20 years ago, the World Wide Web was barely invented. Only sort of techie people in universities used email. The world has changed dr radically due to technology, but women have driven more economic growth. With all the articles you read about China and India and their impact, our impact has been more. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more specifically why that is. But first, I wanna give you a little bit of a caveat. I'm talking in all these slides about the growth of women's income and the growth of women's economic status compared to men. We still have a long way to go. We all know that the gender wage gap is 77 or 80%, depending how you, me you measure it. Women earn less than men. Far more women than men are in, live in poverty in the United States. And um, women really run into problems at retirement. Between 1990 and 2007, women's real income grew 35% compared to 6% for men. This is adjusted for inflation. And I find this very interesting from 2000 to 2007, when the economy really started going south after the dot-com bust in 9-11, women continued to do better than men. We saw 6% real income growth, while men's income actually shrank. And since the Great Recession, Nobody's doing well. We're all losing money. Women's income, however, shrank just 2.8%, while men's dropped 4.1%. So we're still doing better even in the worst of times. What's most exciting to me is that this change is happening at both ends of the spectrum. The poorest of the poor, that is single moms, are seeing real improvement. They have seen real improvement since 1990. In 1990, about one in three single moms lived in poverty. Now that number was even higher, of course, if you're black or Hispanic. But overall, it was one in three. By 2010, 
your chances of living in poverty if you're a single mom are just one in four, 25%. That's still way too high, but it's getting better. And it's getting better because women are better educated and they're earning more money. This is really good news. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, the number of women earning $100,000 or more has soared in a 10-year period, 1995 to 2005, we went from 500,000 women earning $100,000 or more to 2.5 million. That's five times growth, 500%. Okay, it's still a really small number. It's just 5% of women who earn $100,000 or more, compared with 15%. And that's a really big range, right? You could be earning $101,000 or $10 million. So, I'm not saying that this is evenly distributed, but it is definitely good news. The big question is, if this is good news, this is, this is all good stuff, but is it going to continue, or will it stall out? Is the economic revolution yet another uh, stalled revolution that we'll see? Well, <clears throat> my co-author Maddie and I have five reasons why we do not think that this revolution shows any sign of stopping and they are big economic trends. The first we've already talked about, women are more educated than men. The second is, of course, the shift to the knowledge-based economy where physical strength is no longer at a premium. The third is the shift to the service-based economy. Many of the professions and uh, uh, employment sectors that are poised for growth are service sectors or pink professions where, with lots of women, like healthcare, where we all know manufacturing and construction are not coming back. Four, technology. Cloud source sourcing, virtual workplace, results only work environments. I could talk about these for a long time, but in a nutshell, these are ways where lots of people who've never met each other around the country can work day or night and produce really good work collaborating together. And this is really good news for women. We often need more flexibility. And number five is that famous war for talent. Sooner or later, the baby boomers really are going to retire. We thought it was going to happen now, but it turns out it's really not such a good time if you're planning to live off your stocks. So, um, but the war for talent basically says that into that vacuum left by baby boomers, large corporations are going to want the best talent. Increasingly, that is women. And corporations have to change if they want women to stay. So it's really easy to look at statistics about the growth of women's income and the growth of women's control of wealth and say, and that's the end of the story. But I always ask, well, so what? This doesn't mean anything unless that translates into influence, into political influence, into social influence, into influence within corporations. But we can translate our money into power if we choose to do it. I always say money doesn't buy happiness, but it can buy change, and it has, it has bought change in the past. When I set out to write the book, um, I set out to write a book about stay-at-home dads, uh, and I very quickly realized that it couldn't just be about the dads, um, that it also had to be about the moms and about women and about changing gender dynamics. Really, the book ends up being about gender. Um, which was not my original purpose. I think it was easy for people to understand why women would want to get into the workforce. Um, it's easy to understand why it is you would want to earn your own money and develop a sense of professional accomplishment. It's easy to understand why women might want some of the men things. It's not so easy for most people to understand why men might want some of the women things. Uh, and you know, because I think that in a patriarchal society, uh, that's perceived as a step down. Uh, not just by men, but also by women. And a lot of women are not, are not comfortable with the idea of their husbands taking a step down. Uh, we're not in a place where we've really validated uh, men fulfilling some of those traditionally female functions. Um, and that, to me, is really the key to understanding why it is that we seem to be, um, why the daddy shift is stalled. The daddy shift is the expansion of fatherhood beyond pure breadwinning to include this capacity for caregiving. Um, and it's like women's movement through the workforce. Uh, that expansion, I think, has, has stalled somewhat in recent years. 
Uh, for example, the number of stay-at-home dads has flatlined in recent years after uh, appearing from out of nowhere and expanding really rapidly. I think that one of the biggest problems we face right now is a very high level of cognitive dissonance uh, around our experience with gender. Um, we're in, a, in an economy where women have to work uh, and where men have to share the housework and the childcare. And yet, uh, we're still living our lives according to uh, standards that were held by our grandparents and by our great-grandparents. And this creates a lot of stress, a lot of cognitive dissonance, um, situations where fathers feel guilty because they're not going to work or mothers feel guilty because they are going to work. And none of that is necessary. We don't need to feel that guilt. We don't need to um, fulfill uh, these roles that were formulated by 19th century industrial capitalism. We can live a new kind of life. We can build a new kind of family. We can have happy, loving homes. But I think one of the things we need to do is to let go of those obsolete expectations and let go of this idea that we are somehow going to be able to recapture uh, some lost black and white paradise. Instead, we need to look at the opportunities that have been created um, by this actually relatively scary and unstable situation that we're in. It's terrible that so many men have lost their jobs. It's terrible that we're facing so much uncertainty, and this has affected me as much as anybody. At the same time, however, we have to ask ourselves, what are we gaining through this process? Uh, men are gaining opportunities to develop a bond with your children and to develop skills at home that you would not have had an opportunity uh, to gain otherwise. And for mothers, uh, it may be very difficult to take on that breadwinner role and to have you know, these, these two or three or four people depending on you for money and health insurance, <laughs> for food and shelter and health insurance. Um, however, look at what you're gaining. The opportunity to uh, really focus on your career to gain the satisfactions that come with that. I really think that this is something that tr transcends uh, any particular set of political values or any set of religious values or any geographical location. This is really about a big economic change that happened. Uh, women going to work and a lot of job instability. Men losing the ability to reliably support families and women coming in and making themselves essential to the family's economic survival.